after R. Kelly's federal child pornography trial. The singer's team is concerned that he won't get a fair trial because the judge will not ban potential jurors who have seen the surviving R. Kelly docuseries. R. Kelly faces obstruction of justice charges because he allegedly rigged his 2008 state child pornography trial. Federal prosecutors say that he threatened and paid off a girl whom he filmed himself having sex with when she was only 14 years old. Jurors acquitted Kelly on all charges in that trial because the girl did not testify. She and at least one other victim are now expected to testify in this federal trial. You'll remember that R. Kelly was recently sentenced to a 30-year prison term in his previous federal trial. In that case, he was convicted on charges he used his fame to sexually abuse other young fans. Still with us, we have our former federal prosecutor, Nima Romani, and criminal defense attorney, Josh Schiffer. And joining us by phone, our own court TV legal correspondent, Julia Janae, who reported on R. Kelly's previous federal trial. Julia, can't thank you enough for joining us. Give us your reaction, please, if you would, to the judge possibly allowing jurors who have seen the docuseries. We may be having technical problems there. Let's give Julia a moment to see if she can join us. All right, we're going to need to go ahead and see if we can get her connected. But let me ask you, Josh, prejudicial or not, that these juries who have seen, jurors rather, who have seen the docuseries can be allowed to serve on the jury? Uh, there's absolutely no way I can fill in for Julia. I'm sorry. No. Uh, yeah, it, it is absolutely we can all agree. We can all agree. You can't. <laughs> Go it's ahead. absolutely legitimate for the court to be really concerned with this prior material. Jurors are supposed to be completely independent, able to set aside all of their prejudices. If they do indicate that they have some sort of prior judgment, there's a rehabilitation process to ensure the integrity of the jury, to specifically to prevent some of the collateral attack problems we're seeing in Johnny Depp's case or some of these other high profile issues, the Scott Peterson case. So this defense is really hitting on this uh, and a strong point in my opinion, no one with these clearly biased media consumption backgrounds should be able to sit in judgment for my client. I would pretty much uh, sit on that and riot it as far as I could because it's one of the few good arguments Mr. Kelly still has. And I think it's a legitimate argument. What do you think, Nima? If you were prosecuting this case and the defense said, no, 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 we don't want any potential jurors who have seen the surviving R. Kelly docuseries because we don't want them to be biased as a result of seeing that, how would you respond to that as a prosecutor? I would say that it's not a categorical bar. If a juror can say that they can be fair and impartial, consider the case just on the evidence in this case, because let's not forget, there's a documentary, there's a whole other trial that happened, there's tons of media attention. You'd have to be living under a rock not to have heard about R. Kelly. I mean, this abuse dates back to the 90s. So if I were a prosecutor, I would make sure that anyone who's seen the documentary, anyone who's heard about the previous case, anyone that's read media reports or seen it on social media, they say unequivocally under penalty of perjury, they can be fair and impartial, they can set that aside, because that's all you need. That's the legal standard. If you're just looking for folks who had never heard of R. Kelly or the allegations, you're not going to find anyone, Judge Ashley. All right, let's talk about double jeopardy, because some viewers have just heard he's in federal court again. How? Why? How is that possible? So a reminder, in the first federal trial, we know that he's been sentenced to 30 years in prison. That was based on charges that he used his fame to sexually abuse other young fans. Now, this federal trial that's starting that we're talking about is, in fact, claiming that he rigged a trial in 2008 because he paid off one of the witnesses, one of the victims. And so tell me about what is double jeopardy and why this isn't that. Let me start with you, Josh. So traditionally and most easily, double jeopardy stands for the idea you can't be tried uh, for the same set of actions twice. The state gets one bite at the apple, and it's not fair if they are, don't prevail to come back and prosecute you again. But it's been expanded and contracted over time, and different agencies and different defenses have been developed to specifically allow 
choice of venue provisions, different st strategies to be brought up by various prosecuting groups, because generally this is something the prosecutors deal with more than anybody else. And there are bluntly really good reasons that uh, the same overall behaviors can be prosecuted what appears to be twice because they're different enough to stand alone. In this case, it is the charges that he basically rigged a trial. He hasn't stood trial for that yet. There's so much. And to your point, Nima, of everybody's heard of R. Kelly, and this has been going on for a very long time because he had the state case, he was acquitted, then he had a federal case, and he was convicted. Now he has another federal case based on the acquittal of the first state case, and he has two other state cases. How is none of that double jeopardy? So there's the dual sovereignty doctrine that says that the state and federal government, they're separate. So even though typically we don't see subsequent federal prosecutions after a state case, we have seen them recently. We saw it with Derek Chauvin. We saw it with uh, McMichaels, Roddy Bryan for the death of Ahmad Arbery. So occasionally when there is a compelling federal interest that isn't vindicated in the state case, the Department of Justice will step in and prosecute someone after a state trial. That's the Department of Justice's Pettit policy, named after a deputy attorney general that drafted it. So even though it's atypical, it's not double jeopardy, and it does happen, Judge it, Ashley. It does happen. All right, Josh, you know that I was just joshing, get the pun, when I said that you couldn't fill in for Julia, but we have Julia Janae back with us, and I love having her on because she has such an attention to detail. She covered this case. Julia, tell us, if you would, uh, your thoughts about this current federal case that R. Kelly is currently embroiled in. So, Judge Ashley, we're going at it again. This is almost a repeat when you think about the fact that it's another federal case in another jurisdiction, but this one hits close to home. This is where R. Kelly rose to fame. This is his hometown. So I think it's all the more important for this case to be coming out here, but you still have state charges that are pending there. Interesting that this trial is going to look and feel somewhat different, mainly because he has a different legal team that's sitting there defending him. He had a completely different crew that was defending him in the federal case in New York. But now Jennifer Bond Jean, she is his new attorney. She was there representing him at the sentencing for the New York trial. But this is her first time really representing him at trial. And she notably represented Bill Cosby in his appeal, successfully was able to appeal him. But who you see there, that was his uh, original uh, team, Deborah Canick there. Uh, was there in front of that jury and speaking about that documentary, the Surviving R. Kelly, he told that New York jury that it should have been called Surviving Off of R. Kelly. So there's no getting away from that documentary once this case gets started. And you mentioned the new attorney, the current attorney, Jean. Let's get, or Jennifer rather, let's listen because we can actually hear her voice. Have you had the opportunity to speak to Joy? Yes, I speak to Joy regularly. And Joy is just fine. She is sad. But she told him, and she sent me a text message telling him to pray um, and put God's, you know, put it in God's hands. And she loves him, and she's, and they're going to get through this. That's what she had to say to him. Is he a predator? No, he's not. No, he's not a predator. All right, outspoken. And she spoke out about something else, Julia, and that was... The rumor or statement that R. Kelly is having another baby. Tell us more about that. All right. That has been a rumor that's been swirling that Joycelyn is pregnant with his child. This is how his attorney, speaking for him, responded to that. She said there's no truth to those reports that Joy is releasing a tell-all memoir. And she's certainly not pregnant with R. Kelly's child. People are insane, she says. Carry on. That was a New York Post article uh, not too long ago about the possibility that his girlfriend was pregnant. Uh, she's also been called his fiance. I noticed a letter in the file that she wrote to the court asking for mercy back before he was sentenced. She called himself, herself rather, uh, his fiance. So it seems that they may be engaged, but uh, whether or not she is the one who penned this tell-all that I noticed on Amazon that popped up a couple of days ago. Uh, it has yet to be seen. Sounds like the attorney is saying she's not writing a tell-all, but there is a two-part book that is out there on Amazon right now, and it teases that there's going to be another part that will be released next year.
Wow, Julia, you shared all that information when you learned it, and it is fascinating that that tell-all came out, and is it the same one or not? We don't know. All right, Julia, Janae, thank you so much for joining us. Nima and Josh, we have about 15 seconds each. Do you think we're going to see more convictions of R. Kelly coming with all these cases, Nima? The answer Thank is yes, the, fe the feds don't lose, and they got him dead to rights with five victims in this case. All right, what do you think, Josh? A hundred percent with what Nima said, and he's very experienced and smart. I want to say his comments early on double jeopardy, that was a hundred percent the way the government makes those decisions, and, and that's the truth. We're going to see more justice for R. Kelly's victims. Listen, friends of Court TV, Josh Schiffer, Nima Romani, always appreciate all of your expertise in joining me here on Court TV 